Hi there. I'm Emily Orr, Assistant Curator of Modern and Contemporary American Design here at Cooper Hewitt. And tonight we are celebrating the installation of our magnificent Surtout de Table in the exhibition Tablescapes Designs for Dining. I hope everyone enjoyed Tablescapes earlier this evening, where this masterpiece of Cooper Hewitt's collection is once again glowing in the galleries after a near 30-year absence from public view. I am delighted to welcome Sarah Coffin, who recently retired as curator and head of the product design and decorative arts department here to deliver the lecture, Diplomacy and Dining, a look at the table architecture and cuisine in Empire France. She remains involved with the museum, having curated the gallery of tablescapes with the Surtout. And while at Cooper Hewitt, Sarah built a reputation as the resident dining expert as seen in her magnificent 2006 exhibition and accompanying catalog, Feeding Desire, Design and the Tools of the Table, 1500 to 2005, that explored the evolution of European and American designing through, dining through the design and function of eating implements. I can attest to the fact that for many years following, she received regular requests for interviews on the history of the fork and the spoon, a topic of enduring interest. Tonight, she is taking us back in time to discuss the culinary history of banquet dining featuring elaborately designed centerpieces, which began in the 16th century and was extended during the Napoleonic era to also include notable chefs and new culinary masterpieces. So thank you all for coming tonight. And now please welcome Sarah Coffin. Thank you, Emily, and it's great to be uh, back here. Uh, not that I've I haven't been in the meantime, as you can see from the exhibition, but also wonderful to have my great colleagues Emily and Cindy Trope uh, here uh, tonight. Uh, this, as Emily said, was, is a topic that seems to be not only of enduring interest to me, but a great number of other people as well. And I do think that. Um, my door being generally open in the office, that uh, Emily and Cindy probably had a good course in uh, all sorts of things that would come my way about how, when did this start and when did that. So, um, But this is a little bit of a case of really having worked on the topic for a while, finding that the intersection of architecture and the table is very significant and one that is perceived to be in the field of uh, architecture. Uh, and the point being that as with uh, both the implements which were often given, people traveled with them, status of symbol, sim symbols of status, uh, also these uh, masterworks on the table uh, were very much about uh, politics, diplomacy, and so forth. Uh, while I intend to speak primarily of the diplomatic connections of diplomacy, cuisine, and architecture of the table in Napoleonic France, the subject of table architecture must start quite a bit earlier. The connections between dining in the era of Louis XIV in the late 17th century and that of Eugène de Beauharnais and his famous father in law, Napoleon I, are very strong. Sugar played a key role, and its use has been considered decadent since a Byzantine princess married a Venetian doge in the 11th century, introducing the fork as an instrument for eating suckets, small candied fruit, thereby convincing much of Europe that these objects were as decadent as the foods they were for. While luxury, sugar as a luxury item has been part of culinary history, since medieval times, it was oddly that it was in post-guillotine Paris that the cake reached its artistic heights, despite the fact that Marie Antoinette may have lost her head for her remark, real or apocryphal, let them eat cake. While the pâtisseur most no notably architecturally inclined Marie-Antoine Carême, to whom we will come back, made his fame on pièces montées, uh, which are essentially sculptures, usually in sugar, but uh, arranged in an architectural form, early actual architects were doing the thing with sugar, same thing with sugar uh, sculptures for the table. Here we see 
uh, a group of images from a book uh, published by John Michael Wright called the Rivoglio della Salema Comparsa Fata in Roma, which is essentially was for Roger Palmer, the Earl of Castlemaine, his banquet for the Pope of 1687. It was January 1687, and this is relevant because this was created by a Roman architect. It involves all of these figures here, including, which you can't see until you see the whole thing, it's huge, it was miles long, um, uh, the arms of uh, Great Britain here, and the arms, uh, I mean, which was of James II. And this was the point. This was a, a, a banquet. Now, banquets in the 17th century and actually somewhat before meant uh D dessert banquets. You were invited. Why? Because what was the most expensive thing? Sugar. So you entertain on a lavish scale, and the banquets uh, would have all these sculptures. And in fact, here they showed their high level because they had. They also had the napkins sculpted like waves and boats and things. Uh, the ceiling in the room that was used for this banquet was designed by Pier, uh, Pietro da Cortona, an eminent uh, painter, and. Um, and Bernini, among others, did contribute such sculptures. He didn't do this one, but uh, somebody who had worked in his, uh, uh, his uh, office, shall we say, uh, did. And uh, the point was that this was the ambassador from the court of James II. James II, they were celebrating the nominal return of Catholicism to England in 1685 when James II came to power. Uh, uh, Roger Palmer got the position in 1686, and it took him almost a year to organize this fabulous extravaganza for his entree, his arrival in Rome. And here you see, oops, I'm sorry, I forgot to flip. Here you see the, Palazzo, uh, the Piazza Navona and what, with Bernini sculpt and other sculptures that form this decor de théâtre in the middle, very much is what they were recreating on the table. They were trying to do the similar sort of display for the table that was uh, on the in in the piazza. The here is a magnificent buffet master buffet table, which is what uh, you will see soon again, but of 1691 from Bologna, and the both. Uh, whoopsie, you can see that strange thing. Elaborate plates and dishes served all around uh, for a, a buffet uh, shows the level of that any diplomatic mission, this particular one was from an emissary from a German court coming down to uh, pay a visit to Bologna, but it, it goes across the board in Italy and with uh, Louis XIV. Here again is this very odd arrangement of, um, of figures in icicles all sculpted in sugar with various objects like wine glasses and so forth. And this is really the wine table. You can see the glasses here. Um, so th this case, it's not about food, but you are about tasting and testing different wines, which were apparently perhaps being kept cool or something, the, some, the glasses or the urns that held them. Uh, uh, once, and then we're starting to move forward. In 1739, one of... Um, uh, Louis, um, actually a sort of granddaughter of Louis XIV, married a French, I mean a Spanish uh, infanta, and they produced, uh, and other weddings have produced similar things. This is a rather simplified one, but you can see the arms of uh, the fleur de lis of France there, um, and this was again a dressed buffet. Uh, you will, as I mentioned, a carême, the great, the really original sort of celebrity chef who was in the Napoleonic era, very much took his cues from this, despite the fact that, or perhaps more likely from this, uh, because this and the um, the court of Louis XIV uh, was the model he was basing it on with, and we will see why, because the Louis the 15th and 16th eras were associated in uh, Napoleon's mind with uh, decadence and uh, the, obviously, the retreat of uh, being out in public. Uh, in After Louis XIV died uh, in 
1715, the court moved back into Paris. People preferred Hôtel Particulier, the original townhouses, um, and they ate more. Be- they ate in what a purpose-made dining room, really, for the first time. Uh, so you get purpose-made dining rooms. Here you have a group of men, and this is actually quite unusual in France. Usually, both sexes ate together, but they seem to be having an oyster orgy, and perhaps as might be suggested by the nude female sculpture. We're going to join the women late soon. <laughs> In any case, uh, very much what the revolution was pur- purporting to be about. And I just spoke to someone about their interest in wine coolers, and there is one sitting there cooling cooling the white wine to go with the oysters. So, um, But this, this kind of frivolity, which was associated with the mid-18th century, was what was against. I mentioned in the mid-18th century also as the antithesis of this grand architectural structure in terms of objects, sugar sculptures primarily, uh, that were around uh, with this. One is a table at Marley from the Louis, the Palace of Marley showing the first and second courses. Now, generally speaking, the point was there were sometimes two courses or three courses, but there were not. Every, there were not an infinite number of courses as became really true in the 19th century. And the, all the, there was no arch, need for much architecture because the Turines holding these all the food that went out at once for the course were all placed on the table and the, the food and their holders became the design. A simpler dinner was simply a matter of four uh, different dishes. And the idea was that you were supposed to um, ask, I have either the valet or often just your neighbor pass it to you because one of the things about these smaller dining rooms was that the food uh, was out there, which meant that the servants didn't have to stay in the room and you could actually gossip and talk about things you didn't want to do so in front of the servants. So uh, this was also part of this sort of more flirtatious uh, society. This fan, while it's rather difficult to see, combines both worlds. It's got these circular tables, as as would be true in a mid or or oval or whatever, but for a a special occasion. So it does have some sort of silver surtout, but it also has all sorts of dishes arranged around the edge, combining this idea of ornamentation. On a much higher level, I would say, than that last image, you have the great uh, centerpiece uh, by... Uh, my sonnier, who was self, he was a silver goldsmith from Torino, Tur- Turin, who uh, became goldsmith to the king when Louis the Fifteenth, Louis Quinze, was crowned as a young man, and when he got married, I should say. And uh, for his wedding, he produced gold snuff boxes, sword handles, and so forth in the li- brand new Rococo style. This brought Rococo design in into the French thinking already by the 1720s, but essentially most of the commissions start in the 1730s. And here he designs a whole surtout for the Duke of Kingston, and there's virtually no surviving great French monumental silver complete of the 18th century. I, there are some exceptions, there, the, uh, but really there's nothing compared to what there had been, because if it wasn't Uh, getting melted down for a war. The French Revolution took pretty much care of everything else. However, the Duke of Kingston wasn't French. He was, he had actually had to, however, there was always a shortage of silver in France. They always seemed to need it for coinage or wars or something. And so he was obliged to bring some old silver uh, over from England and have it reworked here, uh, it, there are a pair of these. We don't think the main surtout uh, element was ever made. It was designed. But what do exist are both of the pair of terrines. And they were originally, um, I mean, they were in a collection and were sold um, some time ago with both of them together and Baron Tissen and a private collector 
uh, bought one, and then Tissons went back on the market, and, and um, then Cleveland got got it to share with um, another museum. And so Cleveland has one, and the private collection has the other. But so there, at least everybody knows where both of them are. And uh, uh, but they are incredible works where he actually models the the crustacea, the lobsters for the lo the. A, a pota oi is a sort of stew, and one of them was obviously supposed to be a seafood one, and the other one has things like parsnips and game on the top of it, and that was obviously for game stew. But this clearly is the begin, you know, really where you see somebody doing that, and you'll see he's put in the bit the room, style of the room, his own design for the room that it was maybe going to be seen in. And he, by this point, was styling himself in his engravings as an architect. So here is a, sil and there are more examples of silversmiths who can perceive of themselves as architects and become someone. And in fact, for Louis Kansas' father-in-law, Prince Stanislas, who, uh, when he lost the throne in Poland, he uh, uh, Louis Kans gave him the Alsace, and he had and uh, was seated at Nancy, also. So, uh, but uh, he did end up sending an entire library over to him in P Warsaw before he moved, um, and so uh, this kind of commission would have been more common, I think, had they had the silver. This ironically, this whole set the pair went to Russia when the Duke of Kingston became uh, the ambassador of Britain to Mos Moscow, and, I mean St. Petersburg, and then um, came back to his wife. They do, he and his wife divorced. She kept the silver, and um, eventually it found its way back to Paris, so we think heavily, happily was out of uh, Russia when the Russian Revolution came took place. But now you can see a bit better the the crustacea and the game here uh, uh, from these uh, from this set. As I mentioned, these the setting was very much uh, more uh, of the of this sort of. Uh, to sort of private nature, you will see this group gathered around a candlelit table, dogs in the room, um, looking rather like ours, asking for, for something at the table. Uh, anyway, and that, but they still maintain this idea of the head table, the 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 I honored guest and the, presumably the Prince uh, Louis Francois de Conti um, up there at the head table. They only sit on one side of the table, which gives you lots of opportunities to have display. But these were smaller tables, and they didn't have that much room. What is important is you will note that in an, a uh, dinner of some significance, the people are sitting in candlelight. Candles were very expensive, and more so the crystal. The uh, the cut glass crystal like uh, chandeliers and the candlesticks, but you will also notice this golden color. And generally speaking, when they refer to the white service, it is indeed for having the principal meal in the early afternoon or in daylight, and the tendency to have things gilded, usually silver gilt, uh, in the evening to create part of this golden light uh, in the evening was what uh, luxury would do. I show these two paintings. Uh, show our two examples. One's workshop of Martin Van Mytens, the other's by Martin Van Mytens. Uh, this is the uh, different example of... of um, of the feasts of Joseph II of Austria, but here you see it's bright daylight out, and he's got a a white service, silver on the table, but you you don't see much of any sort. And then there are a lot of sort of individuals, and then of course high up is the uh, royal table. Here is uh, his um, at his wedding uh, supper to Isabella of Parma. Um, over here, and you can see it's all lit up with candles, and everybody's sitting around in candlelight. So that would have been more important because obviously it was using more candles and at e in the evening. And now you start to see the surtu coming in a formal arrangement in a period of the 1760s. And there it is with a mirror plateau underneath and these scrolls of what is probably sugar, but the introduction of porcelain figurines, white porcelain figurines, which we will see, these are the kinds of things that would have been on, uh, you know, figurines, the figurines standing on this mirrored plateau. 
So this was as an Augusta dinner, but it obviously it had candles and it had uh, figures. Uh, these are Italian figures um, up here that have these same scrolls that would be like those on the mirror. Uh, but that leads us in, now we're into the Louis Says period, and we discover we're back in Rome, um, and Italy still having remembered that it hasn't been that long that um, really Italy was the source of the great cuisine, and France was uh, learning, I mean, they were certainly getting it sourced from Catherine de Medici and Henry II, who went to Italy, and so forth, And but regardless, it being the province of the architects for tables there, certainly. Here are two Italian examples of table designs, uh, both in Cooper Hewitt's collection, use of tempietos, figures dancing sort of around a central figure. This particular drawing, I am, I am on the fence about. It could be a tabletop designed for a sur, as a sur two. It, it's the ruins of Pompeii, as ne, of some actual buildings as excavated shortly before in Pompeii. And I also know that architects, to support the, themselves, were selling these models as co made in cork, generally, to support themselves exactly in proportion of Roman, famous Roman buildings, but also of Pompeii. And this could indeed be a display table of uh, Pompeian ruins uh, for the grand tourist. In any case, uh, these were almost certainly were made, to, they could have been made in wood and everything else, but they're most likely still made in sugar. So once again, you have architects considering uh, the architecture you could put on the table. I next move to Josephine, the mother of Eugène de Beauharnais, the purported and apparent owner of our surtout up, uh, upstairs, because very luckily, those of you who heard Ulrich Laban uh, speaking, I had uh, the, uh, a couple of weeks ago, he brought up the topic of the various design elements in common with Hotel Beauharnais, which he has been researching and so forth. And it happened that right as we were doing the, the collection handbook of the uh, museum, that I mentioned to him that I was very frustrated by the note in the file that it said it was in the present from Napoleon to Eugène de Beauharnais, and it looked every bit of the quality as if it could have been, but I was hoping to document and he had just, with his colleague, found the records of Eugène's shipping records from Paris to Munich when he had to leave Munich, I mean, had to leave Paris to go to his in-laws um, uh, to take a present and quit Paris uh, after um, Napoleon uh, uh, left, uh, was exiled. And in it was one surtout by Tomir, uh, to be picked up, actually, parts of which were at Tomir back again uh, for repair and for the additional of flowers. I have to assume that the flowers were not likely to be gilt metal, so he may have been asked to provide some silk ones or perhaps even porcelain ones from Sev. Uh, in any case, the idea of gold was, uh, despite the revolution, was very dominant, and the way they expressed this gold was generally in gilt bronze. Tomir, like Karem, was a product of the Ancien Regime and the uh, monarchy, and uh, he had, in fact, it was somewhat older than uh, Karem, he had done work uh, in... Uh, in the Ancien Regime, and he had managed to take over a uh, commissaire priseur, I mean, a sort of, well, it was really more of a, of a actually more of a decorating house than an auction, but uh, where he got a lot of work, and including, it was, attention was uh, drawn to him by Napoleon. So uh, here, this clock, although not by Tomir is by Ravrio, and what is also interesting is they wanted the latest. So here's Josephine, and I have looked. There's a a, a piano and a spinet, both, uh, in Malmaison right now. And the piano looks not does not look like that. It has a long, high upright back, but the spinet doesn't look like this either. And and this is you this curve 
This is purportedly Josephine playing the piano, and the decor, you will see elements that you would see at Malmaison, but it's obviously a slight fantasy because he wasn't looking at the piano, but it has all the same motifs. And so there they are commissioning, or at least you see these griffins, you will see shortly, um, works in Ormolu, and Tomir was the first one to pick up on this. This is Josephine as Empress. Um, and just to give you an idea of the environments that this would go in, this is a watercolor uh, from the Thaw collection in Cooper Hewitt's collection, which has the swans that Josephine loved. This is a uh, bathroom and boudoir at Malmaison, and then this is a period watercolor of a salon of very similar in period to the um, to the. Uh, Surtout that you will uh, uh, you uh, will see the details are very similar. Eugène was the son of Josephine and an aristocratic father who had been guillotined in the revolution. But somehow um, this all he was apparently very well liked by everybody on both sides of the aisle, and indeed um, was able to uh, somehow negotiate with them. And because he was very good entertainer in the sense of host people, um, Napoleon not only uh, gave him the funding to redo an older Hotel Particulier from the early Louis Kahn's era in the no latest Empire style, but he also, um, a lot of which was, I think, his mother participating with her love of the period taste, but he also um, gave him, made him Viceroy of Italy. And uh, looking at the, we'll get that in a minute, but here, so here he is in his Viceroy of Italy uh, garb, and here we have a design for a, an inkstand by um, the architect Giuseppe Barberi. And the inkstand shows these neoclassical garlands and so forth as well. It's also in the exhibition. <coughs> And you will see the other motifs that crop up on his walls and everything else. So it is a sort of early example of Gesamtkunstwerk. But it's also interesting to me that this clock, designed by an architect Bavari, about Barberi, who also did a design for a centerpiece that he clearly considered a piece of architecture because he's even laid out the floor plan just as if it was going to be for a set of buildings. But it probably is a massive sugar sculpture. It could have been done in marbles. They were starting, as we will see. And for those of you who haven't been down to the Valadier exhibition at the Frick, you should go because Luigi Valadier was another silversmith who became a self-styled architect. And here he is designing in multiple hardstones, an incredible, almost circus maximus. But um, you know, again, rep repeating the piazza as a work of architecture on the table. And these are done in multiple hardstones. In fact, uh, very much the kind of taste that uh, we will later see would have peeled in uh, Russia as well. But these parts were all movable and interchangeable. This appears to have been designed this way, but I think there were other extra pieces and so forth that if you had another length, you could always add more buildings and so forth. And that is something about these. We have five pieces here, and that is obviously complete. It's huge. And as Ulrich said, which was very helpful, that they are working on restoring the dining room right now in the Hotel Par Particulier, the Hotel Beauharnais, which is now the German ambassador's residence in Paris. And uh, he said, oh, it is the perfect size for that dining room, <laughs> rather covetously. Um, but in fact, I suspect that this was given to um, given to uh, Eugène on the occasion of his uh, marriage uh, and uh, his being made a member of the uh, imperial family. Napoleon officially adopted him in 1804, although he did not get included in the six line of succession, or he, obviously Napoleon wouldn't have divorced Josephine. Um, and he, um, but at that time, he also um, he also married uh, his uh, he married his. Um, uh, German wife, Princess Augusta Amalia Ludovica Georgia of Bavaria, and who was the eldest daughter of King Maximilian, 
uh, which is why Eugène moved to Bavaria uh, and where his father-in-law later made him Duke of Leuchtenberg and Prince of Eichstadt. So um, as I said, he was able to be very sociable, and Napoleon gave him the Hotel Beauharnais money so that Eugène would entertain for him. Uh, Eugène, uh, Napoleon and Josephine, neither of them liked to eat in public. Josephine had rotting teeth, and Napoleon felt very ill at ease, and so they didn't like public uh, dining. Jo uh, Napoleon made an exception for this when he married Marie Louise and decided he'd better do it the royal way since he was marrying royalty and did have, as we will see, see a uh, public dining occasion, but uh, otherwise it was clearly planning to leave it to Eugène. But he, all, having made him viceroy of Italy and heir presumptive to the Italian crown, uh, he, I suspect that this went off to Italy with the idea that Eugène would use it for his uh, diplomatic entertaining there. Uh, and uh, only later when he came back up to Paris, uh, had it with him, and, and then sent it off for repair. Here is the wedding uh, that was painted in 1812, but the wedding was in 1809 or t uh, 10. And you can see, there it is, there's one piece. You see they've been separated because they're having to sit at this horseshoe shape. But you've got one, two, three pieces there, and then more going around here. Uh, can similar candelabra these sort of oil lamps at the end, and everybody is arrayed uh, in style, facing out at the audience of the, of the nobles and politically elite who would have uh, been there. Uh, details to show you again that these artistic considerations are important, but it's also a sort of a Beauharnais style that you get with these swans. This is a wall covering from the collection, swans. And then you have these, these are actually bacchanal figures. This is grapes all around. So this is presumably something that would have held a bunch of grapes in the middle, but it does suggest the wine. I mean, I don't think it was used to hold anything related to wine, but uh, dancing around with the grapes in their hair. And But it is the idea of the three graces, which was actually purchased by Eugène de Beauharnais. And uh, of course his, um, his uh, sort of in-law, I should say, Pauline Bonaparte, uh, became the Duchess of Parma. Here you again have the swans here, the swans there. This is already out in Tournai, which is now in Belgium. But to show you the impact of this incredible work, my feeling is that Tomir, working for the imperial household, was taking his cues directly from Percier and Fontaine, who did design Malmaison's interiors for Josephine, and he would have been using uh, this famous architect's, uh, the, the famous architect's designs uh, for the table and then executing. You will see the motifs in the Hotel Beauharnais here, on the furniture, on the woodwork, and it all matches up again with, uh, this is probably a dado railing, so it would have been there, not in the house, but just, again, these motifs that he picks up from Percier, whoopsie, Percier and Fontaine, and then I just want to flip through a couple more. That's actually an Italian drawing, with again, with a basket, and the same Griffins, a dancing figure for a furniture mount, and a lot of other uh, examples of these from the mounts collection of furniture mounts. And what was their point was, of course, to reflect light. And you, this is therefore with the idea that again, you're thinking about the dining room for evening use, which was a lot more expensive. Uh, but this giant pair with the, again by Tomir with both gilding and bronzing. Uh, again, whoopsie, get to fast a little fast. Um, so um, this is a chair in the collection, and this kind of motif actually had, you know, the. This is of the period. There may be a connection to Napoleon, but you will see the furniture in the Hotel Beauharnais, uh, the Hotel Beauharnais furniture, and can easily visualize having it, again, being celebrating Napoleon, which he would have done, too, as his diplomat. The Sevres porcelain was advancing with new techniques, hard-paced porcelain and porcelain that would... Um, 
this is actually the factory showing off that they're showing off the scientific nature, new colors and new wares. And here we get to our man, Marie Antoine, or otherwise known as Antonine Carême, who was a real entrepreneur. Um, he, uh, he, his famous saying is, the fine arts are five in number, namely painting, sculpture, poetry, music, and architecture, the principal branch of this being pastry. So here he is, he thinks of architecture as that he can do architecture and pastry. And indeed, that's what he does, these great pièces montées. Here you have a sort of pyramid of cakes and things. And these are, are this is from what his earliest book on pastry, uh, the picturesque pastry pastry maker, and he's actually done sort of chinoiserie and um, rustic and uh, all the rest of it, uh, loaded in in 1816. But uh, there, in 1802, a Parisian lawyer turned restaurant critic, and there's another new thing that's going on in Napoleonic France, is the creation of the restaurant, because of course, not every, you know, uh, there were there were far fewer of the aristocracy hiring cooks at home, and more people actually uh, eating somewhere in a more public place. But in 1802, the Parisian lawyer turned restaurant critic, Grimaud de la Reynière, professed that cuisine is linked to nearly all branches of human knowledge. Um, chemistry, painting, sculpture, architecture, geometry, physics, pyrotechnics, all are more or less closely allied with the great art of fine dining. While I can't speak to the matter of fireworks, he, uh, Grimo argued that the artist who, in addition to a profound knowledge of culinary art, possesses a fair smattering of all these sciences, should reap the great benefits indeed. And one should remember that, it, particularly in, if the, for those of you who've seen the film um, uh, about uh, Vatel, uh, the great chef of Louis XIV's era, who was to the Prince de Condé in Chantilly, had a dinner when Louis XIV decided to invite himself to dinner, which meant invite himself and a hundred of his nearest uh, associates. And Vatel was supposed to produce the whole event, and this included the food, but it also included fireworks. And you will see many, many prints of fireworks of the illustrious Duke of Brunswick week, Holstein arriving in Bologna, and boom, 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 uh, there are p uh, prints of the uh, uh, fireworks. Well, likewise, uh, it was up to Vatel to produce the fireworks, as all as well as all the accommodations and the fee feed uh, for both the staff of and the, the um, VIPs who came. And in fact, he ordered fresh fish to be delivered right on the morning, and it did get there, but it got there late. And by this point, poor Vatel, so over wrought had committed suicide because he thought it wasn't coming. So it's, it's, it, it, it makes a great movie, but it sounds more like a movie, but it was real life. So Karim came from very humble origins, but rose um, in the uh, revolutionary, in the first decade of the 19th century to produce these fantastic meals. And he also um, had a very, he, but he was a traditionalist. He, he, whoopsie, he went, he created, while well, he created new looking, this is real, now food to be eaten. As a, The sugar sculptures were generally made with some gum arabic in them, so they were there to be maintained. You didn't, you didn't necessarily get to use them multiple times, but you might have been able to. Of course, a porcelain figurine is much more r uh, useful. It may be expensive to get in the first place, but you can keep rearranging them and doing different things. So uh, here is Karim, who had, in addition to creating magnificent sculptures and uh, in sugar, was also actually creating them with new foods with lighter pastes and like macaroons and things. And here you see as a comparison, though, he's making his displays of cakes essentially resemble the traditional 17th and 18th and now 19th century uh, displays as opposed to, uh, you know, more modern uh, display. But he is, he is innovative in his cooking, and he um, uh, does that, uh, you know, to, with great fanfare to the point where it was so good. He was a modernizer, and he, he classified French sauces into the four groups that 
remain known today and um, uh, and Escoffier would build on, but uh, his architecture was traditional. He also wrote many books, which is one reason we know so much about him, um, but he, he prided himself on being the architect of food. Uh, he his great cooking came into play when um, these two, uh, with these two gentlemen here, uh, after the um, fall of Napoleon in, uh, and his exile in 1814, um, uh, Tsar Alexander marched into, do we have that slide? No. Uh, I think it's the next one. Here he is, marching into Paris victorious in March 1814. And, um, this is Talleyrand's townhouse. Well, the Elysee Palace had had something wrong. I think there'd been a protest or something in it. And so Talleyrand invited um, uh, Tsar Alexander to come stay with him in his townhouse. He had already employed pretty much extensively at Valence, his house in the Loire Valley, uh, Carem to cook for him, not exclusively, but uh, any time there was any diplomatic dinner. And in fact, Napoleon paid for uh, Talleyrand once Eugène de Beauharnais had gone off to Italy. He paid for Valence so that Talleyrand, who was again an aristocrat himself who managed to find favor with Napoleon, uh, partly for trying to, play, but he played both sides of the aisle. So he had this great chef. Well, Tsar Alexander gets there, and he's got the royal forces on one floor with pleading to have Louis the 18th, Louis de Sweet, installed, and the Napoleonic uh, uh, requesters asking for the uh, reinstatement of Napoleon on another floor. And he said, but I have to eat first, so let's have dinner. And he, obviously everybody's worrying about what's going to happen. Well, in fact, he had everybody at the table, and then he realized he was gonna have to make a toast. So what did he do? He raised his glass, to Karim, <laughs> avoiding having to make the choice then. But the next morning, Napoleon was out and Louis de Zuit was in. And, uh, and it all took place probably around the table with a much like our surtout de table. But in this, in this is the kind of room which you can see has the same motifs, which was Talleyrand's house. In fact, Talleyrand had a terrible time getting rid of Alexander the first until finally he, and he, when the Lise Palace was ready for him, he finally said, all right, you can have Carême while you're in Paris. And, and then he moved. Um, and then, in fact, he invited Carême to come to Russia. And Carême went to Russia, but Alexander I was off on a campaign. And by the time uh, he got back, uh, uh, Karim felt he had been ill-treated by his staff and left, uh, but he went many places. Here, in fact, is another interesting detail, was that Alexander I was much smitten with Josephine at Mal and met her at Malmaison, but he, he uh, and she with him, and they had, and he wrote that he could have real conversations, much as with a man, but it was so, such a significant um interest that she actually gave him this extraordinary cam agate cameo, which was known as the Gonzaga cameo. Uh, it was owned by the Gonzagas in the Renaissance, but it was a Roman cameo of, of um, a sort of husband and wife dash brother sister who were very both intellectually and much in love with each other so there was a lot of significant and it remained in Alexander's collection and is now in the Hermitage but here are our two figures uh, sadly he was walking with uh, Josephine in her ever diaphanous and rather low cut clothing outside in the cold in the spring and in fact she got pneumonia and died shortly after that so he he was actually very stricken by that but he would have returned again I suspect this is the kind of centerpiece in fact I thought this might have even been a, d a Russian design because of the nature of the pink which is rhodonite perhaps and the green which could have been malachite for uh, for Russia, and there was a note in the file that said that it had a Russian inscription. Well, we looked, and it doesn't, and I suspect, therefore, it is an Italian Roman design, but uh, it could, it was the kind that, again, one, two, three, four, five, you've got similar tri uh, figures, this Tempietto with figures on it mixed 
Ormolu, uh, very much again an architectural statement. Another view of the two two different uh, Valadier. But here's a man who was a silversmith who again really became an architect um, and then created these works of architectural space. And then just to um, end on, I wanted to show you this. Uh, design drawing from, again, the 1785 to 185, which uh, you can see these groupings, much like the ones with the stones and these swags and so many of the motifs, but the, again, very like the um, Valadier arrangements as well as the the one we saw on the hard stones. So you're a the idea that that Eugène was down there seeing these uh, Roman versions. Um, they had this great architect, Persier, and Persier and Fontaine, who were producing designs for Tomir, and Tomir commanding uh, the attention of, of uh, Napoleon, this wonderful object that uh, appears to have been really been the present for the wedding, his adoption, and everything else at all, and being made viceroy of uh, Italy, all of which happened at the same time, uh, undoubtedly was the source of this commission. And based on it and the dates of the other known Tomir, surtout, there are most of them all later, 1810 to 14. And so this really is another reason to think that this is much crisper, this one in its detailing, to think that this one upstairs is an early one and does show the uh, connection of Napoleon wanting to make the connection to Rome uh, politically, of obviously planning, putting most of his family in charge of Italy, and uh, using it for all the political power that imperial Rome uh, meant to him. So there's a great statement of, of that, and at the same time of having a chef who is um, who is creating the extraordinary arrangements of food that are supposed to accompany this. Uh, I'm, most of the Italian ones, you notice, don't show them f f actually holding food, uh, but the the French ones do appear to be made for holding, what, be it decorative food or sweets, going back to the concept of um, architecture. So Carem uh, took Roman architecture and that of Palladio, and, and who he re referenced. He actually went and studied in the Bibliothèque Nationale. He studied architecture before making these arrangements of food, so this was not coincidental. And the food was displayed as architecture, but the ingredients were innovative. And to that, we have this confluence of Talleyrand, Tsar Alexander I, Napoleon, uh, and um, uh, many others uh, in power, including in Vienna, and uh, George the Fourth, who had Karim come to cook with for him, and their table arrangements show the impact of this extraordinary moment when everybody came together in Paris and created a style. So thank you very much. I hope if any of you have questions that I've left some t a little time for questions, and, and um, feel free to ask. Yes? Just so what we have upstairs, what we have upstairs, would that have been filled for, with desserts or would that have been, um, would there be food around it? Did people sit around that table? They would have sat around it or possibly on one side if it was a sort of display dinner, but um, principally that would have been uh, likely since it's equal on both sides that it would have been one where you'd sit around it and the food would have been outside. Uh, they would have had, as I, I think, predominantly things like colorful petit four and so on, or candies on the glass dishes that stand up. And then there might have been grapes and other fruits in the baskets. They probably had glass liners, those baskets, to hold the grapes and so on. And though, while the glass is remarkably still with the... Uh, stands, the cake stands, um, they, they're not in the um, baskets, um, and then, of course, light, and uh, it's unfortunate that the lights can't stay, apparently, are not 
function working that well enough for us to keep the candle light on and the candles but the idea was all those candles and those big candelabra and you notice how tall they are in comparison that was so that you could a see through to your per, the person you wouldn't have been talking to them you'd probably talk to person on one side or the other of you but you would see them but more importantly the heat from the candles wouldn't melt the women's makeup and so they that was the primary reason but it would also enable the candles then not to be blocked by the people to flicker off the mirrors that would have inevitably been between the windows and again you would have depended on the windows if you were having a daytime dinner but I think the fact that these are our gilt bronze is very significant because it means that it was intended for evening dining and that was shifting over in that period but you know it's not till you really get gaslighting and so forth in the streets of Paris and elsewhere where you can expect to be able to see your, your way around that unless you if you're living in a great chateau it means you have invited everybody for the night because they're not going to be going out in the pitch black with no light so um so those are all important considerations the color meaning something uh the motifs have meaning there are figures of the seasons uh, arranged around, the one holding a wheat sheaf, another hold, uh, identifying. So uh, those would have all had significance, but the important references were that they clearly fed off ancient and, you know, antiquity and imperial forms. Yes, I... And please just wait for the microphone, folks. We are recording, so we just want to make sure that gets captured and documented. When did Paris get gaslight? Well, I have to say, I'm not 100 I can't remember. I did look this up once in the past. I think it wasn't till the teens or 20, teens or 20, late teens or 20s, but um, I, should, I should know that, and I did know that. But in any case, after the Napoleonic mm -hmm. era, um, I mean, there were wick lights with some oil that were in transportation vehicles and so forth, but um, the gas isn't later until later. The oil lamps, in fact, in the in the um, design from Tournay, let's see if I can go backwards here. Um, they, in fact, well, even that wedding picture, uh, where there's a, um, you do get oil at this period. It's just not heavily used and that they didn't wouldn't have had it much in the dining room but here that's a brule that's something that could have been with oil but uh that's actually an end iron but the point is where is it uh, here these these boat shaped these ancient boat shaped things are all could have been for uh oil uh so a little startling at the table, but um, and why they'd have preferred. But and the other thing is, of course, what the candles were made of. And of course, these would have been made with something like beeswax that wouldn't have imparted a terrible smell while eating, because it was a very, uh, you know, it was it was Napoleon's wedding. So um, then, which you can't go much higher. But there was another image, I think, from Tournay. I can't remember. I well, I'll go backwards all the way, but. Uh, where they showed another lamp in any case. Um, so the, the, the oil lamps were around from the late 18th century, but they weren't really very functional in terms of, of being able to travel any distance, and it didn't help you. It was on your carriage. It wasn't on the street. It, there was no day for that. Yes, in the yeah. back. Oh, you've got the, okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, um, good, we'll do it. explain the dinner service a la Russe versus? Yes, I was actually had meant to do that, but we, I had thought for a long time that Karim, and he did clearly get exposed to the service a la Russe when he went to Russia, to St. Petersburg, to be the chef for Alexa, uh, Alexander the uh, First uh, in, I think it was 1815 or 16 that he went, and, um, uh, but it does appear to have been coming in earlier. The, um, it probably with the Russian conquest, I mean the Russian victory, uh, uh, that it was sort of around that time. In any case, Service à la Russe was, I mean, Service à la Française was what I showed you the diagrams of with the dishes forming the ornament of everything on the table at once. 
Now, this didn't mean there was only one course and everything from soup to nuts got on the table, but it did mean there was a set soup and start sort of first course, and then there was another course with meats and so forth, and then the dessert table would be completely changed. I mean, you would still have the, the you couldn't just come along and take that off and put on something else, but you would have the dessert foods served obviously separately, and sometimes, um, and as I said, in the early days, you were probably coming for dessert. Um, and certainly in a large function, but or a buffet. I mean, it was very much, a, a lot of royal functions were, I mean, where it was a wedding, where they had to invite a lot of people, and then those people would be served in buffet, and maybe the marrying couple and their immediate relatives would sit at the high table. Um, service à la Russe was the idea of sequential serving of courses. And as I mentioned, they were, along with the term uh, bistro, which comes from the Russian uh, soldiers in Paris at this time with Alexander I, who were going that they wanted to eat quickly. And they were coming in and saying in Russian, bistro, bistro, which means fast, fast. And it turned into bistro. Um, that the idea of a re types of restaurants, um, and of course, it wasn't expected that the sort of gentry were going to be predominantly eating there. It was going to be travelers and the soldiers and so on. So this is the association with bistro with being separate from haute cuisine. Um, but the there for a long time, you know, Talleyrand, I mean, uh, Carême was a great proponent. He, I think he represented to Napoleon, again, it's the political power of the statement. And he represented what was now really firmly with his talents fixed that French cuisine was the ruler in cuisine and traditional French display was going to win the and his cooking uh, was going to be win the day. In other words, France had a really exportable commodity in its cooking and also a, a position of power. And so Carême was still doing things like the ancien regime, despite the fact he was hired by old and new and quickly flipped over to being able to cook for Louis XVIII's general entourage. But he was not, clearly politically, he was more liberal than, uh, and uh, was more socially minded, about, uh, even though the, clearly the type of cooking he liked to do was for the higher up. So, so the as I said, there are changes, of course, with the service à la française, but the uh, the difference is that you don't. A, it is easier to have the soup, the food be hot, because you don't have to get something from the other end of the table. But B, um, on the other hand, leaving them there. Uh, where I mean, leaving them on the table, you can get rid of the servants and have everybody pass them around if you want to talk, whereas there's a greater deal of transparency because Napoleon, identifying more with the power of Louis XIV, wanted to have, you know, when there were these entertaining, have these big banquets. It was out in halls again. There were long tables, which is why you can have a sur de de table because it's now something for a long table. And that was... Um, that was also part of the service à la France, enabled as it came in, the service à la France, at Russe coming in because you didn't have so much on, else on the table with all the food. It could be served up one at a time and uh, served two people. But again, again, that brought whatever staff was there was, um, actually you will see, into back into the room, which was no longer supposed to be important. Actually, you can see that very well in the marriage um, here, whoops. Uh, yes, do you see here? Here is here are the the servants serving. I mean, these are the uh, these are the men actually in this case serving. Well, there's men here, and these are the apparently the valets to the people sitting there. So, in other words, each person had either one or one to two had a servant taking care. of of serving the uh, uh, serving them in this particular instance because it was a royal a royal wedding, but normally you would have had the, this would be the kind of thing I mean the arrangement you would have had in the Napoleonic era of of people serving you one at a time, which is a la Russe really. 
there was somebody in the back. Yes, I, I have a question about uh, the team that uh, chefs like Karim had back then, because you see a, a tremendously elaborate display, and right. the food had to be tremendously elaborate as well. Did he have someone that also styled the food with him? Like you see rolls today he of was, food he stylist? Was a, he was the stylist because there's actually quite a bit of uh, writing about this where he was encouraged to go to drawing school and went because he needed to know better how to present the drawings of his, I mean, he would create it all on paper, do effectively design drawings of his presentation, and then he would design the dessert on paper. Obviously, he had chefs working for him, making the things to his recipes, but they were, and, and I'm sure constructing them, but he, he was the stylist. And so, and he published his own work in these cookbooks to show people what was he was intending to achieve. And so that's another thing. He was really, in that sense, he's really very definitely the ancestor of the celebrity chef of today because he was promoting his designs and his way of doing things along with the recipes. Anyway. Hi. I'm really curious about that wine cooler that was in the uh, oyster luncheon. Did that actually hold ice, or uh, was yes, it just it metal? Yes, they usually did have ice, uh, but they also were lined with lead or sometimes another copper, uh, but a metal that would immediately hold the cold as well as keep the water from leaking through the wood. And so you, they sometimes would uh, put very cold or icy water in there and actually drain it out and leave the bottles in there to stay cool because they could do that. But, it, you know, it depends. That one appeared to have divisions in it. So I, and let's, and remember, we're not talking about the refrigerator and ice cubes. We're talking about blocks of ice. So Where you- they get ice from? How would well, they make they, ice? They, this was, this is quite a, an amazing thing if you think about it. I mean, obviously Russia has ice somewhere nearby right at, at, at hand, but, or at least Northern Russia. But, you know, in Western Europe, Europe, I think they went to caves and they store, you know, stored it in caves and then they'd haul it in very large blocks um, and and break it up, you know, with, you know, as little as possible. I mean, break off a chunk of whatever size they needed. Um, but there's quite, and of course, you have to think about they're having to anticipate the loss if they're trying to put it on a cart and carry it. So they've got metal line carts and metal line. Uh, containers and they store it usually underground. I mean, that's why there's often cave storage or underground storage to keep things cold once you get your ice. But they're generally speaking, a lot of times it's a matter and it's why the Europeans to this day, I would think, I think, don't like their white wine. Uh, they don't like ice in their water and they don't like white wine as cold as we expect to drink it. They're expecting it to be cooled by a cold river water that could be put in and cool off that metal very strongly and then you put the bottles in and you get them cool but you don't get them refrigerator cold, yes. Uh, yeah, over there. Hi. Okay. Um, I just wanted to know in your research, did you find that um, due to interaction with other cultures that the architects of cuisine and f architects of food and generally architects were influenced by other cultures and they reflected in their work? Well, yes. I mean, certainly the culinarily, as this, you do f find that, you know, there's... Obviously, it speeds up a great deal in the 19th century when people actually get things like avocados and tomatoes from the New World and so on. But um, before then, um, I think it's it's more of an idea, or they will, you know, trade or traders coming back from Asia and uh, or the Caribbean. Obviously, the sugar itself is a long distance. It's just not a food stuff that will spoil. So, uh, but all of those things were extremely expensive. You couldn't get 
grapefruits from Florida or whatever all the way back to Europe by the kind of boats that they had. So there were other things that people may have tasted if they were explorers, but they were never going to see until uh, mechanized transportation came along. But I think the biggest thing was the publication of printed books by superb draftsmen. There's a wonderful Dutch woman who went to... Suriname and elsewhere, it was a book is in the Cooper Hewitt Library, um, Sibylla Marion's, in the 17th century, and she documents minutely fruit and ve vegetables and pl flowering plants that people want to have them, but they so they know they're out there, so they're sort of looking for things. But as I said, for the most part, it's more the idea of the decoration that comes back on a cabinet from China or Japan that then's interpreted by local craftsmen with what we now call chinoiserie and recognized to be very far away from anything likely except there really are pagodas in China and they made fanciful versions of them in Europe so you might well find a pagoda in sugar on the table. It's more a case of reflecting a westernized idea of what was actually out there, but not an accurate one, except for these few things that could be transported for like sugar uh, for a long time. Hi, I just wondered, um, thinking about the earlier sugar paste centerpieces of the dessert, the, the dessert course, would the dessert course have been served in a separate room, or would it have been on a separate table in the early? Usually, I think that they were in also in the, the desserts were arranged sometimes in a buffet separately on as we saw with that wine one and the master buffet but many times also as sort of available in dishes on the table that were separate from the surtout de table which you weren't going to reach out and disturb that was decorative but it may have been the same foods available on the table but also on a buffet table and another thing that is interesting to connect back to our friend the Byzantine princess is that in fact the first forks that really come into use in particularly in northern Europe were these small ones and the point was that you were bringing them for yourself. So when somebody had a service made, it was for serving at a banquet of desserts. So the forks are very little. And with the exception of meat, I'm not talking about meat serving forks, but I'm talking about individual forks that you might put into your mouth. And and uh, so they were perceived as being elegant accessories to a dessert um, before they got actually used for meat and so forth. Um, any other questions? In the front here, and then maybe we'll. Thank you. What do you think caused the decline of the sort too? I th <laughs> well, things. That things. Uh, I think. I think in some ways, believe me, having looked, just been in the Hofburg sto storerooms in Vienna, I can tell you that there was no decline in the Surtou in the 19th century in Vienna. I've never seen so many Surtou of various periods, ranging from one by Tomir, or maybe it's several, that had about eight, 12 mirror parts and could be arranged in multiple different <laughs> rooms of different sizes. Um, but they went on. There were some of gilt bronze, certainly from the Napoleon, I mean, the mid-19th century and even the 1880s. So um, I think what happened is, though, again, you have different sizes and shapes of dining table coming back into fashion. A lot of the Napoleon III era and the um, Franz Josef era was often round tables and so forth, then you might have one single element. And it's why, frankly, a lot of these surtout that were made, and obviously, let's face it, there's a limited number of people who are going to have something like that. But um, uh, there are gradations, and there certainly are ceramic ones, with, and they came as the time of the exhibitions to be made with electroplated bases and other things. But you will often find a large center of the table piece without the assorted other parts that go with it. And I think, I think that really persists 
right through the era of the grand entertaining of Escoffier and the late 19th Edwardian era, and then you have World War I and a complete shift over to moder- a lot of moder- more modern lifestyle and lack of servants and all sorts of other things that just a great the the idea of the ostentatious was less popular after that so i think that was really it probably was world war one that it was the finalized the decline right well thank you very much thank you.